Hello there and welcome to Shots in the Quark. In this episode I'm going to discuss a rather disturbing idea that haunts modern cosmology like a spectre. Take a look at your surroundings right now. Everywhere you look you'll see what appear to be concrete physical entities persisting through time. This probably doesn't seem like a particularly interesting observation. We're all used to seeing desks, chairs and computer screens existing around us. However, some plausible cosmological models predict that this observation is unimaginably unlikely. In these models, it's far more likely that everything you're experiencing right now is an illusion. A single momentary experience of a disembodied Boltzmann brain formed spontaneously in the void. Sounds freaky, doesn't it? Or maybe it just sounds confusing. In this video, I'm going to tell you all about Boltzmann brains, where the idea came from, why it matters, and what it means for cosmology. So, what exactly are Boltzmann brains? And what do they have to do with a guy called Boltzmann? Ludwig Boltzmann was one of the true giants of physics, playing a massive role in the development of statistical mechanics. Very loosely, statistical mechanics is a framework in which the behaviour of very big objects is derived from the properties of the very small things that they're made of. An historic example of this is how the laws of thermodynamics can be derived from the properties of microscopic particles. Boltzmann, in particular, played a key role in explaining how the second law of thermodynamics, that the entropy or disorder of an isolated system must always increase, could be derived by considering the number of ways a massive collection of particles can be arranged. What Boltzmann realised is that there aren't many ways of arranging particles such that you end up with a nice, orderly, low entropy structure. In contrast, there are loads of ways of arranging these particles such that you end up with a disorderly, high entropy state instead. Think of the difference between a sandcastle and a lump of sand. There are far more ways of arranging grains of sand such that you end up with a featureless hill than those that end up as a sandcastle. This observation explains why the second law of thermodynamics works. Entropy always appears to increase because it's far more likely that a system will end up in a high entropy configuration than in a low entropy one. We can picture this by considering something that's known as phase space. A phase space is a space of possible states that a physical system can be in. Each point in the space corresponds to a particular state of the entire system. Let's consider the phase space of a collection of sand particles evolving through time. This large red area represents all of the high entropy states of the system, all of the states where our system is just a lump of sand particles, featureless and disorderly. The very small blue area represents all of the low entropy states of the system, the states where we have a sand castle or any other sand sculpture. As time passes, our system will trace out a path wandering through the phase space. If we begin with a sand castle in the low entropy region, then it's very likely that after a small length of time, the system will have wandered out of the low entropy region and into the high entropy one, where we no longer have a sand castle, just a featureless lump of sand. Once our system is in the high entropy region, it's extremely likely that it will just stay there, wandering through this region with a low probability of re-entering the low entropy region. This is why sand castles end up as featureless mounds, and why featureless mounds don't turn back into sand castles. Entropy nearly always increases and never goes down, because there are far more high entropy states than low entropy ones. Since the low entropy region is always very small, it's far more likely that a system will increase in entropy. But this doesn't mean that entropy only ever increases. Boltzmann showed that actually the second law of thermodynamics is only approximate. It's extremely likely that the entropy of a system will increase, but there is a possibility that it can spontaneously decrease thanks to a random fluctuation. Random fluctuations may push your system back into the low entropy zone. It's incredibly unlikely that this will happen, but if the system is left alone long enough, then at some point there will be a fluctuation that decreases the entropy. With this understanding of entropy, Boltzmann proposed a model of the universe that sought to explain why we find ourselves in a very low entropy world. Boltzmann pictured reality to be a single, infinitely large space that's already reached thermal equilibrium, and so is in a state of maximum entropy. The vast majority of this space is featureless, with no possibility of life forming. 
But as we mentioned earlier, if you leave a high entropy system alone for long enough, then at some point a random fluctuation can occur which spontaneously reduces the entropy in a particular region. A universe such as ours could come into existence as an extraordinarily rare fluctuation occurring in this infinite space. In an infinite space with infinite time, eventually you will get a large enough fluctuation in entropy to produce the low entropy universe we see around us. Boltzmann believed our world was an island of order that spontaneously fluctuated into existence in an infinite, otherwise featureless universe. This sounds like a neat idea, but it's here that we're going to encounter the disturbing problem of Boltzmann brains. You see, the larger an entropy fluctuation, the less likely it is to occur. It's pretty likely that a few particles might bunch together in a small, temporary orderly structure, but it's impossibly unlikely that trillions of particles will spontaneously arrange themselves into a planet like our Earth. What this means is that we should be very suspicious of the universe we find ourselves in. Our universe is a truly massive region of low entropy, and it would take an unimaginably large fluctuation to produce it. This means that the probability of our universe forming as a statistical fluctuation is so unbelievably small. This isn't a problem by itself, however, since even the most unlikely things will happen in an infinite space with infinite time. What is a problem is the fact that the probability of being in a smaller universe is much, much larger than being in a big one like ours. If universes with conscious observers are formed from statistical fluctuations, then it is much more likely for a single galaxy to fluctuate into existence than it is for an entire observable universe to fluctuate into existence. For every universe like ours, there should be millions more that consist of just a single galaxy. So why are we in such a large universe? The problem gets even worse though, since you can repeat this argument several times over. It's far more likely that a single galaxy fluctuates into existence than a whole observable universe, but it's also far more likely that a single solar system fluctuates into existence than a whole galaxy, far more likely that just a single planet forms than a whole solar system, and finally, far more likely that just a single brain forms than a whole planet. This is what's known as a Boltzmann brain. A Boltzmann brain is an isolated brain, complete with false memories of existing in a low entropy universe, that forms as a statistical fluctuation in the void. If Boltzmann's idea was correct, then there would be infinitely more Boltzmann brains than observers in universes such as ours. The disturbing conclusion then is that if you take your experience at a single moment, you're infinitely more likely to be a Boltzmann brain falsely remembering your past than a conscious observer on a rocky planet in a large, low entropy universe. Fortunately, our continuing experience tells us that we're not Boltzmann brains. This means either that we're unimaginably lucky, or that something is wrong with Boltzmann's model of the universe. Most cosmologists believe the latter. If a model of the universe, or a multiverse, predicts that there are more Boltzmann brains than ordinary observers, then there must be something wrong with the model. So if we all just agree that Boltzmann's model of the universe is wrong, can we forget about Boltzmann brains? Surprisingly, Boltzmann brains turn up in a wide range of modern cosmological models. Even our current model of cosmology, where the universe continues to expand infinitely into the future, is infested with Boltzmann brains. Our universe, in the infinite future, is exactly the universe Boltzmann was describing. Complex life like us can only form naturally before the heat death of the universe, but Boltzmann brains can pop into existence at any time, even after the heat death. So even in our current cosmology, we have a big Boltzmann brain problem. Trying to extend beyond our universe doesn't seem to help much either. Multiverse theories such as eternal inflation have found this problem just as difficult. It seems as though we're missing a vital piece of the puzzle, a crucial feature of the universe which prevents the overproduction of Boltzmann brains. The fact that we are conscious observers existing in a large, low entropy universe and not isolated Boltzmann brains offers a tantalising clue as to what the nature of our universe is.
Thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Please like and subscribe for more Shots in the Quark.